Syzygy, episode 104, Biggest Black Hole. And welcome back to the Syzygy podcast. I'm Look, I'm going to do a little bit of behind the scenes stuff. This is take three of this particular <laughs> episode of the Syzygy podcast. What are we up to? 104 take, now? Yes, 104. Take three. We had, we had the first take. We gave it a shot and had to abandon mid-flight. Uh, why was that? You, I got the call. The call. You know when nursery pops up as your, your phone um, caller ID, then you've got to answer that one. Yeah, you've got to take it. When the nursery calls, you can't ignore that one immediately. And so we had to, you know, part way through, it's like, okay, that's it. Nope, call it off. We'll do it again next time. And then the next time rolled around and I couldn't do it because I had an emergency call from a friend who needed some help. And so here we are for take three. Actually, take 3.5. 3.5, yeah. 3.5. This is the second time this afternoon. Because an hour ago I turned up and the equipment wasn't working. So look, listener, you're just lucky that we're here at all, frankly, at this point. But it's good to be back. My name is Chris Stewart. I am here in the office of Dr. Emily Brunsden. Emily, how are you doing? Hello, hello. I'm doing very well, yes. Good, good. Just to be absolutely sure, everything's fine in the household. Absolutely fine. Not expecting any phone calls this afternoon? Not at all. I mean, if we do, we do. So be it. Now, we've got some stuff we want to talk about this week. But before we do, two things to to address. First of all, did you see the big stupid rocket take off? take off and blow up this I week. did. I yeah? did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a part of me that's like, that's really cool because we're going further in terms of, you know, getting closer to being able to do some really cool stuff. I mean, just to be clear, this, this was the SpaceX, what's it called? The the Starship? Yeah. Big honking, biggest rocket ever. Yeah. Um, biggest uh, payload that we yeah. can do. You know, this is the thing that's going to take people to the moon and, and stuff to the moon. We can build moon bases. And if you want to go even further to Mars, this is the sort of thing that we will need. Yeah. I mean, if, you, if you're into all of that stuff, you want big honking rockets because we want to start sending big stuff into space. And to send big stuff into space takes a lot of rocketry. Um, so, I mean, it was a success in yeah. that it launched yeah. um, and then it blew up. Yeah. And I guess depending on your definition of success. Yeah. Really? So mixed feelings about the success and mixed feelings about whether it should have success. Because yeah. Yeah. whilst we kinda of want it to happen, also, you know, Elon Musk is <sighs> yeah. not Sisogy's greatest uh... <laughs> Anyway. <clears throat> so there's that. There was that. The second thing is sitting on the table here in front of us, there is something which is it's it's a big rectangular sheet of paper. Emily came back from a conference. Um, well, I was conference wife, actually. You were conference wife at a conference that your partner went to. Yes. Where? Where were you? We were in California. That's right. On the lovely, sunny California coast. You were checking out all the wineries. And Absolutely. kicking back in the sunshine, Palm having trees, orange juice. the nice sand. Yeah. yeah While he was... was doing all the work. Exactly. But at that conference, you picked me up a little present. I did. You I did. did. And it's sitting here on the table in front of me. Dun, so I'm just going to turn it over. Oh, awesome. It is a poster. If you look at the uh, show art, the, the podcast chapter art, sitting on your podcast player of choice in front of you, you will see the poster. Um, it is the nightmare world of HD 1897-33B presents Reigns of Terror. This is a NASA poster about exoplanets. Yes. Tell us the backstory on this, Emily. It yeah. is awesome. So back in the early days of exoplanets, NASA set up a really cool uh, kind of website with lots of resources about something called the Exoplanet Travel Bureau. So it was just a nice way to to think about exoplanets in terms of putting them as retro travel posters. Yeah, I remember these. They were like, I mean, you get them a lot over here in the UK, these these sort of lovely visit sunny Scarborough on the coast type ye olde train posters and stuff. It was kind of like that. It was, yeah, yeah. but for exoplanets. So yeah. it had kind of slightly different properties, like visit this particular planet where the plants might be red instead of green. Yeah, or this one where you get two sunsets for the price of one because it's a binary system or something like that. Yeah, yeah. so they're very famous. And then they've released this new, slightly newer series called Universe of Horrors. And so what the Travel Bureau was trying to sort of say, come to these exoplanets because they're quite cool, this series is saying, actually, there's some pretty terrifying places That's as right. well. So they've left behind the, the tra- travel posters and gone more for your horror movie posters. So this one's quite fabulous. It looks like a sort of old 1950s horror movie, Reigns of Terror. And I love the fact that down the bottom it says, based on real science. 
It's death by a million cuts on this slasher planet. So what's the deal with this planet, HD 1897-33B? So this is one where we think there's a whole lot of silicon or glass in the atmosphere and it's kind of the atmospheric winds are so strong that there's basically like glass just ripping everything apart at hundreds of kilometres an hour. It's, it's frightening. I do seem to remember we have talked about this on a previous episode yeah. of the podcast. We'll have to dig that one up. That is awesome. Well, thank you very much. It's always fun to get a present. <laughs> Someone's been away. Right. So on to the topic du yes. jour. Today we're going to be talking about black holes, but not just not just any old black hole. I mean, there are black holes and then there are black holes, right? There are normal, average, common or garden variety small black holes. There are really big black holes. There are super massive black holes in the centers of galaxies and things. But today we're talking about something which just wipes the floor with all of that. Emily, is this a whole new category that we're talking about today? This is probably the biggest ultra massive black hole ultra massive. that we've ever found. Is that is that an official term or is that just the astronomers on the paper going, you know what, let's give it a new name because it makes no, headlines? No, they, we've got a class now of ultra wow. massive black holes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Is this so this isn't the first one of these that we've No, come there's across? a few kicking around. Okay. All right. So. Well, let's get into the details of this. But first of all, who? Who's done this? Who's done what? Where? So this is our buddies. I say our buddies. Uh, yeah. These are these are our colleagues up in Durham. So mm-hmm. just up the road. Just up the road. Here. So we've got um, JW Knighting at Gale et al. who have post- published this paper. It came out kind of the end of March. So because it took us a few goes to get this. <laughs> this was current when we first had the idea. Yeah. Trust us. But yeah, you know, it's not too far. Yeah. So they were looking at a cluster and a particular galaxy called Abel 1201. One of the faves. Yeah. Yeah. And they were trying to... Um, understand some of the gravitational lensing that was going on in this cluster. So we're going to come like talk about obviously what gravitational lensing yep. is and what the, you're going to find out about it. But uh, the upshot was that after looking at the measurements, they were able to measure the black hole that was at the center of this galaxy. And they found that it was 33 billion solar masses. Okay. Now, I mean, anytime you put a number like 33 billion involved in anything, that's a big number. But just to put that into some kind of context, am I right in thinking like that's the mass of some galaxies? Like that's that's a lot that's of mass. That's huge, yeah. So our black hole in the centre of our Milky Way galaxy, which is not small in terms of black hole sizes, is something like 4 million. 4 million, and this is 33 so billion. Yes. So that's quite a few orders of magnitude. That's a big it's black like four hole. four orders of magnitude. Yeah. Different. Wow. Wow. And, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. yeah. And so with a little asterisk that says kind of maybe almost depending on your way you do uncertainties and so on, this is the biggest black hole that we've ever found. Okay. So hence the need for a whole new category. I mean, if this was just a really big, supermassive black hole, because the, the one in the center of our galaxy, right, is a supermassive black hole. That's right. It's millions of solar masses. Yep. Which in anyone's book, like given that you can get a black hole from a star which is to within a factor the same size as our sun, like a bit bigger, right? Hmm. You can get a black hole. Well, you can get whole lots of different sizes of black holes. Well, I guess we need to come to that really, can't we? Yeah, yeah. But I guess the point I'm making is millions, that's big. That's a super massive black hole. But this is like 10,000 times bigger than that again. Ultra massive. Ultra massive. If we find one bigger than that, it'll have to be uber massive and then we're just getting ridiculous. Yeah. So maybe we need to talk about black holes Mm. and their different categories and how do you ultimately it'd be really nice to know where did this one come from yeah (laughs) how in in god's name anyway okay but let's yeah classes of black holes so there's kind of roughly around about five different categories of sizes of black holes okay now the first one is actually much more in your sphere than it is in mine right and these are mini black holes right okay mini in like how many is mini well, I guess the general term is less than a solar mass. Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, when you said it was kind of in my territory, like I used to be a particle physicist, there's a quite a big gap between particles and 
solar mass. But sure, let's well, go with that. Well, not so much for astronomers, really. <laughs> is this, it's is kind of, this a little it's, it's bit small. like anything other than hydrogen and helium as a metal? Is it that kind it's of thing? Absolutely. Yeah. That okay. Kind if, you, of thing. if you're not a solar mass, we're not interested. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're a particle physicist. <laughs> So, yeah, well, we are really, though, the mini black holes sort of idea was quite popular around about the time that they were switching on the Large Hadron Collider for the first right. time. Yes, yes, I do remember this. And, and there was lots of consternation because, you know, this is the biggest particle accelerator that had ever been built. And at some point, they were going to have to pull the big switch, the big chunk switch and go, we're on, we're bashing things together harder than we've ever bashed them together before. And a few people stuck up their hands and said, um, is it possible, just hear me out, is it possible that we could have such a concentration of energy in one of these collisions that we could form a tiny little black hole, which would then grow and grow and grow and suck everything into it and destroy everything that we know it at the speed of light? And all of the physicists went to be stupid. <laughs> no, really, could it? No, I'm sure. No, that, Okay. So someone actually had to do that calculation. And I had on the wall of my office in my PhD, I had the front page of the paper where someone did that calculation. It was one of the leading theoretical physicists of the last, you know, however many years, was tasked with, are we going to destroy the world with the Large Hadron Collider? And the answer was no, but it's worth doing that calculation. Of course, just someone's to be, got to do it. Just to be sure to at least a couple of decimal places that the answer is no. Anyway, so... Regardless, mini black holes are still a theoretical concept. They could potentially sort of pop in and out of existence in kind of a quantum fluctuation, weird universe kind of way. Sure, this is possible. I mean, look, given that we don't really know how quantum and general relativity, which is black hole stuff... We don't really know how they fit together. So there's a lot of big question marks here, yeah. but it's possible. So, sure. Yeah. So theoretical. We haven't ever found one, yep. but maybe whatever. So next class is okay. something much more comfortable for me. And this is a stellar mass black hole. Okay. So these are somewhere around five to ten times the mass of the sun. Okay. So stellar mass as in within an order of magnitude. Yeah. yeah. And actually stellar because they come from the life cycles of stars. Mm -hmm. So very, very large stars at the end of their lives, if they've got so much self-gravity that their cores can't hold them up to even be a neutron star, then that will collapse into a small black hole or yeah. a stellar mass black hole. I mean, we went through the sort of the, the, the end of life of stars several points podcast ago. I can't remember when it was, but I, I, you know, I remember you talking about the fact that, you know, the, the gravitational co collapse gets balanced by outward forces of a bunch of different kinds. And that might be just from the nuclear fusion that's going on in the core, or it might be, we've run out of stuff to fuse. So clump down until you reach various forms of matter that then push back again. So that might be um, nuclear matter, or it might be quark matter, or even weirder. And eventually you get to the point where it's like, no, nah, there's nothing. There's nothing that we can do to stop gravity pulling us in, and that's black hole territory. Yeah. So what? remind us, what size of star do you need to be for that to happen? You need to be bigger than around about 20 times the mass of the sun to be like when you're doing your normal hydrogen fusion right. part of okay. your life. And that's that's not uncommon. Like we think our sun is very, very normal, but our sun's fairly puny for a star, isn't it? Well, our sun's actually some of the, I guess if you were to take a census of all the stars in the galaxy, the sun's on the slightly higher than average okay. in terms of mass. So the 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 very, very average, most common star is probably about 0.8 right. solar masses. Okay, because like there's a lot of little ones. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I feel like by episode 104, I probably should know that. But well, hey, look, I'll tuck it away. Maybe we should talk about the initial mass function or something. Oh, maybe we should. Save that for another time. <laughs> so, yeah, but these, these big, big, big stars, they, they are around. They're, mm -hmm. they're not super, super rare, but they're not super, super common. So we sort of have a few. And we know we of some of our... There sort of neighbouring stellar mass black holes. A good example is Cygnus X1, which mm -hmm. is uh, it's called that because it's actually a um, radio and X-ray source. Okay, so we hence see the X. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's discovered through X-rays. So it's basically there's a there's a big blue star that's orbiting nothing. And hmm. <laughs> when you do the calculations <laughs> as to what mass it's orbiting and how big that how much space that mass has taken up, you're yeah. like. Mm. Uh, something's there. Yeah, but something should be there. We can't see it. Stupid amount of mass in a tiny amount of space. Mm. What could that be? Yeah, which I mean brings us to the the sort of the the first part of really what is at the core of this episode, which is 
how do you know that there's a black hole? And we've talked about some of this mm. previously when we talked about super active supermassive black holes, things which are spitting out stupid amounts of energy and so on in the in the hearts of active galactic nuclei. But other black holes, like how do you even how do you even know they're there? So this yeah. is this is all. So let's take category one, which is the 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 tiny ones. Mm. We don't even know. So let's no. just put them aside. Yep. Category two, you might see evidence for a stellar mass black hole mm-hmm. because. Something else is orbiting it. Yep. But we can't see it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's got to be there, yeah. but there's nothing there. And if you're lucky enough, they, they can be a little bit active as well. So if there's some mass that it's being accreted, then that will have some photon signature as well. Right. So there's some sort of evidence. And is that what that's what's going on that's in the Cygnus X1? That there's some X rays right. coming from that system. Okay. Yeah, so okay. It's... Cool. Yeah, so I mean, those are the very that's very comfortable territory for me. The the stellar mass ones. That's your happy zone. The Good. next the next one I would say is a little bit weird, and this is something I feel that we should do an episode on because I don't really understand. We we do about need to start throwing fast. some of these up on your big clean whiteboard. I know, Emily. I know. it's yeah. disturbingly white. And but now anyway. I have no people coming into my office to clean off my whiteboard oh. with their other physics that they were doing. Yeah, this is this is a good time to do that. Okay. But anyway, so the next class is. Kind of the the tens of solar masses, right? And why is this uncomfortable? I mean, there there are stars which are big, so why? Well, they're not they? that big. Oh, okay. So these are not formed by a single star. We're not. Well, I'm not a hundred percent sure exactly where they come from, but these were the types of black holes that started to be discovered when we looked at gravitational wave measurements. Oh, okay. So the first kind of interactions that we saw were merging black holes. And when you do your sums and figure out what size the two black holes were when they merged, they were coming out at tens of solar masses, which, I mean, lay people, yeah, lay stellar physicists like me were like, tens of solar masses. That's, that's odd. That's 30, 40 solar masses. That's, that's big, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Where do these things come from? They can't be a single star. Um, so I guess the short answer is... Something to do with early universe, lots of black holes around. They're probably coming, they're called these quasi stars that were coming around about two billion years after the Big Bang. I think we talked about that a little while ago, didn't we? They were sort of big, weird stars lots of lots of hydrogen and helium but not much yeah. else and they were just big wobbly meringue stars. They were a bit mm. weird. Mm. So yeah. then somehow those maybe they've lots of those sort of single black holes merged to become, you know, the tens of, tens of solar masses. Yeah. So, but it's something I don't know a lot about, I'll confess. So right. I'm still a little bit confused by why we see so many of those black hole yeah. mergers. And just, and you know, going back to that, like how do we know that these things are there? I mean, that's the second interesting thing is that this very, still very new form of astronomy, of uh, gravitational wave astronomy, um, you need the most energetic, violent collisions in the universe in order to actually see anything at all. We're only sensitive to the biggest stuff, right? right? Yeah. And so the surprise in that was, okay, I mean, look, fantastic. We've seen something at all. I mean, the the fabulous story of we're turning the machine on, the LIGO experiment that that can detect, we hope, gravity waves. Turn it on for a bit of a calibration. Hang on, what was that? Oh, we've seen one. Wow. (laughs) Someone write that down. And very quickly we realised that that some of these early mergers that that we hoped to see were of of entities like these big black holes, which is like, but we didn't think we'd see those. We mm. didn't know that they were there. So where are they coming from? Yeah. And suddenly there's a whole new mystery, which is so cool. Yeah. Okay. So that's definitely one to park so that I can go and dig through, have a good excuse, I think, just to dig through all the yeah. research and figure out what was going on. Because I'm sure there's, there's some good... Uh, stuff being done on where the, right. these black holes are Let's stick from. a pin in that one. So that's number three. Yep. So number four. So number four, we're coming back to comfortable territory again. Good. Supermassive black holes. Okay. So these are the things that we find at the center of every big galaxy. So whether you've got a spiral galaxy, a kind of elliptical galaxy, they've got some big central supermassive black hole. And our definition is kind of somewhere above 10,000 solar masses. Okay. So, but yeah, so 10,000 is on the, definitely on the small side, mm-hmm. but the sort of average, I guessing, it would be around a couple of million. Yeah. So that's covering quite a large range. But the bottom line is, this is not a star that has collapsed. This is much, much, much more massive than that. 
Can I just ask a really naive question? Mm -hmm. Like you were, we've gone from comfortable territory of here is a black hole which is sort of roughly star Mm -hmm. mass. And then we're at now comfortable territory again, which is super massive, which is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of solar masses. Isn't the one that we talked about in the middle there, the one that you're less comfortable with, isn't that just along the way? Like, isn't it just merging as we probably, go? Like, probably, probably it is. Don't yeah. you have to go through tens of solar masses and hundreds of solar masses to get to thousands and tens of thousands and so on? Like, isn't it just a step along the way? It is, it is. But in, I guess in some sense it's comfortable because we're comfortable with the fact that we don't quite fully understand how galaxies form, I guess, overall. We, right, we had okay. mentioned this before that we've got um, models of what we call top-down formation. So do you form a big cloud of gas that collapses into a whole lot of stars in a central thing? Or do you do bottom-up formation where you form the stars first and they sort of coalesce into a galaxy? What we are very, very confident on is that the smallest galaxies become the bigger galaxies as they merge. Right, right. So one galaxy will merge with another galaxy. Those two central black holes will merge and then you get a bigger black hole. Which makes sense. So I guess what you're saying is it's comfortable territory in the sense of we're pretty sure we understand what processes are going on here in order to make that. Mm. So there's this big gap in the middle between the solar mass and the supermassive, which is we're not quite sure what's happening here. Where did they come from? Because we're we're not watching that happening or we're not observing them in the hearts of galaxies now to be able to see how exactly how big are these things, what's happening when they merge, all of that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, they're not around us in the local universe, right. I guess. That's where it comes from. It's a from. lack of detail. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. So, yeah, so our, our central black holes and galaxies, I mean, these are the ones that, of course, we've had the beautiful images of in the last few years. Um, that we've seen from not only our own galaxy but others as well. Yeah, yeah, so. like the 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 direct imaging mm. of these things, which is which is super cool. But but there are other ways, right? You see supermassive black holes, or at least you infer supermassive black holes. I can think of at least two other ways. One mm-hmm. being the active galactic nuclei. Absolutely, yeah. Where like remind us what's going on there because they're so wild. these are feeding black holes at the centres of galaxies. So by feeding this material, which is crossing the kind of point of no return in a black hole and being subsumed into the the mass, so it's growing in mass. Uh, but as part of that process, because this it's just an insane amount of energy, magnetic fields. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, and it really is hard to wrap. Your your head around that like if, if you think about like over the last little while right the, the sun's been going through a particularly or coming into an active phase now and i've got a special app on my phone that keeps pinging with oh my goodness someone's gonna see an amazing aurora it's not gonna be you in yorkshire with your cloud cover but someone's going to and that's like that to me sounds really cool the the concept of the amount of energy that is going on around these you know multi-million solar mass sized supermassive black holes that are feeding on huge amounts of and spitting it out with crazy jets of i can't even fathom what that must look like if you're anywhere nearby yeah. cuz from the other side they like are, from across many galaxies across it's pretty impressive they're they're insane yeah wow so yeah we have huge amounts of energy coming out of these things which we can detect in things like x-rays radio waves we've we've looked at some of these uh, processes before um, huge jets, as you say, awesome. they're just awesome things. Yeah. And so in, in terms of inferring that there's a, a ridiculous supermassive black hole doing that, it's not that you're looking at the supermassive black hole and going, that one there, that I can see. It's what else could possibly be doing this? Exactly. You know, we've got theories and models and, you know, we put all of that together and go, the only thing that could be doing that is one of these, Mm. and a supermassive black hole actively feeding. The other way is what we do with the one that's in the middle of our galaxy, Mm -hmm. because it's not feeding. It's not active at the moment. No. So how do we see that? So we see it through. Do you remember our little little stars, what they were called? I don't know what they're called. Squeezars. Oh, that's right. And they're called squeezars because they get squeezed, because of the crazy gravity. Insane amounts of gravity. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they kind of get sort of you know squeezed into a weird shape and they're whipping around at stupid speeds yeah exactly so these are the the stars that are closest to the central center of our galaxy they're really hard to spot right because we're trying to look through all the other stuff that's in the way between us and the center of the galaxy but 
we can see some of these stars that are really quite close to the center orbiting on insane orbits, right? They're just because there's so much gravitational force kicking around that we can even test general relativity by measuring over the course of years or or maybe at most a few decades you can follow the paths of these things around something you know there's 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 nothing that you can see there but clearly right there there's a big lump of something and all of these stars are whipping around it at stupid speeds Mm. and again you do the maths yeah. And you figure the only thing that could be doing that is something with this mass that we can't see. Yeah. Anyone got any ideas what that might be? Probably a supermassive yeah. black and hole. And in this amount of space. So it, it's, it's not just how much mass. I mean, you, you've got a couple of million solar masses. There's kind of – there's very dense objects in the universe, yeah. right? You can, yeah, yeah. But even if you crush that down to being kind of the density of some of the most densest materials that we have, like neutron stars – you actually can't physically fit it, it in the orbit it of this other in. star. It doesn't fit. Yeah. So you, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've got very limited options yeah. at that point for, for, for what it could be when you're talking millions of, basically millions of suns mm. there in that dot. Like <laughs> limited options. Okay. Yeah. So those are the ways that we can see things of that size. Mm-hmm. So that's category four. Mm-hmm. That leaves us with category five. Of black holes. Oh, yes. 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 Now, these are the big ones. Yeah. Yeah. So these are a relatively new class of ultra massive black holes. So these are black holes that are 10 to 40 billion solar masses. So huge. Yeah. Like huge. we've gone from millions yeah. to billions. billions. Yeah. Is there so a thousand times in the same way that there was a gap between the solar mass and the supermassive? There was that gap of eh, not quite comfortable with this from a theoretical modeling point of view. Is there a bit of a gap here between the supermassive and the ultramassive or do the categories at least as far as we know kind of overlap? One's just a much bigger version of the other. Well, maybe this is my naivety in terms of being a stellar physicist rather than being a <laughs> galaxy <laughs> person particularly, but are these uh, the origin of these ultramassive black holes is just galaxy merges and i mean galaxies merge all the time they're doing it all the time like the space between galaxies is nothing yeah compared to the space between even like stars and the galaxy right the the relative space it seems seems really big to us but but i mean the milky way is going to be merging with andromeda any day now yeah so i mean so i mean obviously there's there's scales there's there's distance and there's distance yeah but in terms of the sizes relative to the sizes of the galaxies themselves they're found in these clusters they're quite close together so galaxy merges seem to be going on all the time and when you merge and merge and merge and merge and merge of course you going to get bigger and bigger central yeah. supermassive yeah. black holes. And, and over, you know, 13 and a bit billion years worth of, you know, universal evolution, presumably that's enough time for some ultra-massive black holes to, mm. to have formed from lots of galaxies, big galaxies, bashing together and making bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger black holes. So are these common are we stumbling across these all the time how no, many there's, we there's only a handful of them that yeah. we know of um and particularly really only one other that's really close to being this big mm. um and there's probably a good reason for that and probably because we're pretty much hitting the limit of how big a black hole could possibly be okay that's so that's an interesting idea because everything we talked about so far is you whack a couple of black holes together guess what get a bigger black hole like mm. why would that end why can't you just whack a couple of ultra massive black holes together and get an uber massive black hole well you probably can you just need a bit more time right for the so, universe to run so the limit here is there hasn't been enough time mm. to get enough of these big ones together to make something even bigger the yeah. limit is simply time exactly right so if you have a you run the universe for another 50 100 i don't know 10,000 billion years Sure. sure. It's all just one big black hole. <laughs> maybe, by that point. maybe that maybe. is the ultimate fate of the universe. <laughs> I don't know. One big, super stupid, uber black hole. Yeah. yeah. But there hasn't been enough time yet. No. Okay. So there's only a handful of these that we've seen that fit this category of ultra. Yeah. Okay. The most important thing, though, is that not only is this big, I mean, because big is, you know, that's, that's quite cool in itself. Yeah, yeah sure. But coming back around to the detection technique, it's how we found it that becomes really important as well. Yes. So we've gone through with each of the the kinds of black holes, other than the first one, which we're pushing aside, 
these different scales of black holes, we can see them in different ways, depending on what they're doing and how they're interacting with the things around them. Mm. But once you get up to something which is that kind of matter, we're talking the mass of an entire galaxy mm. now in an object. So how does that affect how you can actually see these things? Yes. So it's exciting because when we talked about the other detection methods, we talked about like the active galactic nuclei, AGNs, active galaxies. These things tend to be really far away, mm -hmm. right? So that's what we kind of think of as the distant universe. And of course, in our terms of observations of galaxies, distance equals time as well. So Just we remind me again, sorry, maybe a naive question. Why do they tend to be really distant? Why can't that they can't be closer? They, why? Well, thankfully, I mean, you don't want not. to be too close. <laughs> yeah, uh, it just seems that the universe was just a bit more active on right, average. Okay. A, you know, a longer pe period ago, there was there were more galaxy mergers. There was more stuff going on, so therefore there was more matter being accreted into these um, right. centers. So that's an observational thing: is yeah. that the further away they are, the further back in time, the more active they seem to be, or at least that's where we see the active ones. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And conversely, we see this the detection measure of using these squeezars, so uh, stars that are very close to their centres, we can only do that with really local galaxies, right? Yeah, of which there are a limited number. Exactly. Yeah. So we've got this kind of um, two different techniques, but they work at two different distances. So there's not a lot of bridging. You know, if you're working with one technique, how do you check your... Your, your numbers yeah. because you don't have, you can't use yeah. the other technique. I mean, could you even use the, the sort of the, the squeeze art technique, the one that we use for the Milky Way one? Like, would we even be able to see anything even in the next galaxy over? Like it's... Yeah, we can. Yeah, for really? Some, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We can, we can see wow. individual stars in Andromeda. I mean, I, mean yeah. I know we can, but on the, on the resolution of being able to see them whipping around a, a central black yeah, hole? Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe not all the ones are all the way in the middle yeah. as well. I mean, you get, there's, but there's you can see mass movement, I guess, exactly. bulk exactly. movement. Yeah. 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 Okay. And maybe uh, I have to look it up to see exactly how many squeezars we've found. But yeah, they're, they're around. Okay. Around the galaxies, but certainly definitely. limited to the local area absolutely yeah yeah so um i think there's something about round about maybe a hundred that of galaxies in our local region that we use these squeezars and other traces let's call them around their centers to measure okay. the mass okay but the point you're making is we've got these two regimes mm. right we can see ones which are far far away far back in time active galactic nuclei mm. going nuts or we can look really close and see there, literally, those stars there going around something, quick, do a calculation, what is that? Mm. But there's this massive gap in yeah. between those two, and we can't, there's, there's no crossover. Yeah, and so not only is the gap, there's also, if we go to sort of slightly more distant galaxies, we could, we're only measuring the active ones. Yeah. Now, not every galaxy is active, Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Milky Way is not active yeah. right now, anyway. Maybe it was in the past. But so we're, when we're looking at all these other galaxies, we're really limited to just the ones that are doing this particular feeding right at this particular point in time. Right. Whereas, you know, that's not a great way to, it's not to all get of a, them. a it's census not, of all of them. It may not even be the majority of them. It's no. just some of them. Mm, yeah. Okay. So to have another technique that we can use, that we can use for galaxies that aren't active, that are that little bit further away, is quite exciting. Okay. And that's so, exactly what this is. So what's that? Yeah, so we're doing gravitational lensing. Yes. So yep. we are using the fact that these black holes tend to have loads of mass, mm -hmm. and therefore they have effect on light that goes anywhere near them. Right. Right. It gets very exciting. Yes. So we look for lensing where we have a background galaxy and a foreground galaxy. So what happens is there's light coming from a background galaxy. But as on its journey towards us, if there's a galaxy in the way, in the foreground, it doesn't have to be sort of even right there, just close enough, mm -hmm. then the light from that background galaxy gets bent by the gravitational field of the foreground galaxy. So this was, I mean, this was the big prediction from Einstein, right, a hundred years ago, built on the back of everyone else, sure. But it's, you know, it's the, the theory of general relativity that says that mass and energy, the way that affects the, the 
the space-time continuum of the of the universe is that it it warps it, right? Mm. You have a big concentration of mass and energy, and it and it bends it. Mm. the The analogy is like you know a big heavy object on your on your mattress. It just you know bends it down and makes a makes a big divot in the in the mattress. If you were to roll something across the mattress, it would follow a curved path as it goes goes around past it. And that's what light does. Light is just trying to follow a straight line through space time. But if the space time itself is curved by a big honking object like a star or a galaxy, then the light will bend around it. And that's all a lens does, the lens in your glasses or a telescope or whatever. It bends light in order to make an image, the light going through different thicknesses of glass or whatever the material is. It bends the light around and makes, a, makes an image of the object that you're, that you're looking at. Yeah. So a hugely massive object can do the same thing, which is why it's called gravitational lensing. Yeah. yeah. So just like a lens will – the way that a lens works with um, people's eyesight is that it creates an image in a place where you can see it instead of the object which is in a place you can't see it. And, the, I mean, we, you could go and look at gravitational lensing right now if you wanted to because if you go out and look where the sun is, if you saw a background star, it would be in a different spot if the sun's close to it than if it's the sun's in a different place in the sky. Yeah, I mean that's that was the first test of of the the theory, really, wasn't it? When when Einstein had had got all of this together, hundred and something years ago, and they went, well, this means that light will bend around the sun. Yes, yes, it does. Well, we could test that. Yes, we could. How do we do that? You can't look at the sun. That's a bad thing to do. Ah, but we could wait for there there to be an eclipse, and so there was. An eclipse, the next eclipse that came along, quick, go and measure the position of that star beyond the sun while we can look at it because there's an eclipse going on. And we can calculate where it should be relative to where we know it is when the sun's not there, you know, when when it's in a different part of the sky. It appears to be in a different spot, basically, because the sun's next to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the same thing, like we can see that on on the scale of the sun, Mm. But when you're talking huge distances and galactic size masses, you get really big effects. Exactly. Yeah. And what the really exciting part is, is that if you measure that that lens, how much that star position has moved, for example, then you can figure out how much mass the the sun has. Right. You case. can you can work backwards. Yeah. You can use the fact that we know what this is doing and we have confidence in the theory. To the point where, well, let's use the theory to more figure mass, out more the mass of the sun, which works. Yeah. Yeah. So great. We already knew how big the sun was, but we don't know how big these, you know, huge galaxies way, way away that are doing the lensing that you're describing. Hmm. We don't know how big they are, but we can figure that out yeah. from the lensing. And if we're very lucky, then we get an alignment such that it's uh, the, the background galaxy is being lensed not necessarily by the whole galaxy itself, but actually just by its core, by its, say, mostly by its central supermassive, or in this case, ultramassive black hole. How, how does that, is that because the ultramassive black hole just makes up such a huge proportion of the galaxy? Or like how? Yeah, so you can imagine, work? you can imagine it's kind of just behind it. So it's sneaking past almost through the galaxy itself. So the the mass contribution to the lens is like, stupidly 90 whatever percent of the mass of the right okay the galaxy okay. or the of black hole yeah. so what you need is a presumably very rare alignment of you need a, a distant galaxy yep that's not the one that we're specifically interested in no but you need that to be right behind the intermediate galaxy which has got stupidly big ultra massive black hole mm-hmm. in just the right place exactly i'm sure that happens all the time well, you'd think it'd be quite rare, but as with lots of rare things in astronomy, <laughs> this has come up universe. on the podcast before. <laughs> it's a big universe. So the these... universe has a way of providing incredibly unlikely things all the time. Yes, yes. So uh, you know, we've got, as we said, some kind of like maybe like a hundred of these systems at the moment that right. we can start to look at this with, and that's what. This is just the first that's being measured in this particular way, but we've got scope to do this a lot more, right. which is so, very exciting. So this kind of gravitational lensing, I mean, we you know we see this a lot, and there are some quite amazing images. I mean, you know, 
it's it's not like a really nice telescope lens where it makes a perfect image of the distant galaxy, although it can do. But sometimes it, it smears it out in a big ring or you get multiple images on different sides. I mean, some amazing, amazing lensing images. Yeah, it's like wearing somebody else's glasses, yeah. right? Yeah, or looking through a, a crazy old, you know, stained glass church window or something, you know, where it's really, really bobbly. So we've been seeing this for ages, but the use of this technique in order to say, well, we could measure the size of not just a galaxy, but the bit in the middle, yeah. the ultramassive black hole. So that's what, they, what they've used, the, the people up in Durham. That's what they've yeah. done this time. And the exciting part is that it's the, the, the biggest one ever. It's the biggest one ever, and it's the first one with this technique. So it's kind of a double like double record whammy. holder. Yeah. How nice exciting. to do it. First one, and turns out yeah. it's a record it's holder. Huge. I yeah. mean, maybe that's not so weird because it's the easiest things we find first, right? Sure. It's like so, exoplanets. You find the big ones. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, but, you know, it's, it's cool. It works. This technique works. So where did where were the observations taken? Like, you know, the, we, we've seen these images. We've, we've used the gravitational lensing to make this great measurement. And we found this huge black hole, which is fantastic. But, but where? How? Who took the picture? How was this done? Yeah, well, this is a nice reminder that although we have a shiny new toy yes. that everyone loves yes. and JWST. adores, indeed. Yeah. good old Hubble, yay, still doing a great job. No, I'm cool too. Look, yeah, I'm yeah. still. I was the. I was the OG. Yeah, so these these came from new Hubble images mm -hmm. um, that basically were able to image this particular system with a much higher resolution, much higher signal to noise, which meant that your backward calculations of, okay, well, it's bent in this particular way, that means the mass is this much and it's in this particular area, which is actually all done by a really complicated computer model, by the way. It's not someone sitting down with a, a pencil on the back of an envelope saying, Yeah, I don't gee, imagine there's a lot of that what anymore. What does G happen? Yeah. No, these, these, well, of course, because they're quite, you know, this is three-dimensional space yeah. that we're talking about. It's it's so hard stuff. That maths is hard, yeah. yeah. And so it's all done by models and, and you know, what are the most likely models um, that would fit this particular observation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so it's it's nice to see some Hubble data just sort of just sort of poking its head up in the in the avalanche of amazing James Webb yeah. data well, that I mean, we're getting. It, it, it points out not just that Hubble's still up there, but that it's still like this is it's it's not out for retirement. Oh, like no. it's still it's doing obsolete. the thing and it's still a really good space telescope. Like Absolutely. don't if you get a chance, don't turn it down. Oh, Hubble's no. still doing good stuff. Yeah, it's 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 all there. So everyone's still clambering to get their hands on Hubble data. So it's just nice to have that reminder. And I think the the so what Mm -hmm. part which gets even more exciting is that we've got a now proof of concept that this technique works we can do it for a handful of galaxies that we know about now but mm -hmm. our world of galaxies or our knowledge of galaxies is about to explode again again because of because of not our not our old favorite but a whole lot of new missions telescopes <sighs> That are coming out in the next few years, which are going to make this even more exciting. I so, think. what's what's coming up? Well, I'm glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't rehearse this, no, at all. No, 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 no we, we, we literally didn't. No, we didn't. But I was <laughs> leading you that, down that garden path. You did that well. Yeah. So, I mean, one exciting one uh, for those of, uh, people who are interested in galaxies is Euclid. Mm -hmm. Now, Euclid, just it's kind of you can imagine a smaller. JWST. Mm -hmm. So uh, not as big a mirror, but kind of similar in terms of it's kind of pretty much infrared telescope, except Euclid is, gonna, is dedicated to galaxies. It's just like galaxies, galaxies. I want to know about galaxies. Right. I want to do galaxies. I want to do dark matter. I want to do dark energy. I want to measure red shifts to galaxies. I just want to do galaxies. That's what I live for. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. So has Euclid gone up yet? It's going to fly in July. Fingers crossed. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's we'll be you know telling everybody more about Euclid. I think and closer to the launch day. Is it like JWST that it's going to be heading out to crazy L? Yeah, L yeah. Point, they're going or? to be buddies out in Alzheimer's. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's quite cool. Cool. Okay. So that's Euclid. Yep. Uh, we've got now. This is this is a fun one. LSST, mm -hmm. which was the large synoptic survey telescope that got renamed to the Vera Rubin Observatory right? that is now running a project called LSST. <laughs> That's not confusing at all. Which is the large, no, the legacy survey of space and time. Okay. 
fine. And the telescope inside the observatory is called Simonyu. Right. Telescope. Good. But yeah. Okay. Anyway. That's not confusing we're at also, all. We're going to come back to that one because that's a new uh, instrument that's going to be coming online. We're expecting to see some of the first testing in December this year and some of the first light through the full big telescope. Right. And that's, sorry, just to be absolutely year. clear, that's ground-based. Big this is ground-based, ground-based telescope, observatory. Chile, yep. Yep. eight yep. and a bit metres mirror, right. you know, and this is a survey telescope again. So it's going to be looking for galaxies, looking to do be able to do more of these measurements. Right. And then we've got, I guess, our old favourite, it feels like an old favourite to me, um, SKA. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not particularly array. old. It's, it's barely even being built now. But It's been on a horizon for so long, right? Really long. And it's Longer getting, than JWST. Yeah, and it's, it's getting to, to crunch time because yeah. they're really constructing fast now. But this is the one which is being constructed as lots of little telescopes or antennae spread across the Australian desert in WA, Western mm-hmm. Australia, and parts of South Africa, yeah, as Southern well, Africa. parts of Southern Africa, mm-hmm. um, as this enormous, distributed, hugely long baseline, you know, square kilometre incomparable collecting just area the biggest of telescope. telescope. I mean, it's world. just, it's insane. And on, on all scales, it's, it's mad. And yeah, that's that's ramping up big time. Yeah, so that's going to be coming online in the next couple of years. At least the first, you know, cause of it. You do, we don't have to wait for the whole thing to be built. We can start switching on bits of it and see yeah. how it's going. I mean, that's the cool thing about it is that you can, you know, you can use one of those antennae mm. to do stuff. Put a bunch of them together. How many do you want? You know, we could, yeah. we're going to have thousands of these things, but how many do you want? We got we got a hundred. Let's do something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's exciting too. And so with those kinds of surveys coming online they're expecting a thousand fold increase in the number of these types of systems that will be able to measure which de-biases the data so our current bias is this well we can do you know we and we know about lots of active galaxies in the deeper universe but we can de-bias that by adding a sample of not active right galaxies. right so the point is that that the the massive increase in just the sheer number of galaxies, distant galaxies um, that are doing all sorts of things hmm. um, will mean that we've just got a much better idea. It's, it, you know, it's comparable to the exoplanet thing where for a long time it was, we can see lots of big, super, you know, huge Jupiter sized things. Um, that must be what exoplanets are. No, they're just the ones we can see. Mm. And so we get better at detecting them when we find, oh, no, there's all these other ones yeah. as well. Um, it's well, just we knew the big they were ones, there, but yeah. we, just, we just couldn't measure them. We couldn't see them. We yeah. couldn't measure them. And this is the equivalent is yeah. let's go and look at all of the galaxies, as many as we can see, and that will, as you say, de-bias. It will take away that, that um you know, these are the obvious ones hmm. because they're just spitting out X-rays in ridiculous <laughs> numbers, and we can see them. And this will mean that we know what. What does this tell us? Well, it's all linked back to the evolution of everything, right? Right, right. It, it is. I mean, I said I mentioned dark matter, dark energy with Euclid. It's all of these questions because galaxies are our measurement tools, right? I mean, these are the things that we go out there and measure how much the universe is accelerating with those yeah. are the, the things we measure right and so understanding galaxies understanding their evolution tells us about dark energy the acceleration of the expansion of the universe it tells us about dark matter and how that contributed to forming the universe today it tells us about the whole story line of the history of the universe from the big bang to uh, what we see today it's, it's it's everything right so the lovely thing about this this particular research paper today then is that as you say, it's a it's a proof of principle. You mm. know, it's hey, fantastic. You know, we we found the biggest ultramassive black hole that we've seen so far within error bars. Great, but that's not in itself. That's not the important part. The important no. part is we can do this. And wouldn't it be great if we had a huge amount of data that we could then go and start hunting through in the same ways to see what else we could find? Oh, look, look what's about to happen. Yeah, we're going to learn a lot. It's it's really exciting. Yeah, that's cool. Well, Emily, I mean, one of the things that immediately comes to mind after this fabulous discussion about stupidly big black hole things, I find it amazing to think that on that kind of scale, you know, we're talking about 
really large distance scales in the universe. And the notion that the building block is, is not stars and solar systems, it's entire galaxies and clusters of galaxies. Like that still blows my mind that, yeah. that you sort of talk about huge amounts of stuff bundled together. That's your, that's your Lego brick. Of the universe. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, well, um, I might add a point of contention in there. Okay. As a stellar physicist, I'm still <laughs> going to add stars are the foundational aspects of the universe. All right. Can't have a galaxy without stars. All right. Listeners out there, if you have an opinion on what is the fundamental Lego block of the universe, then... Emily, is there a way that people could contact us and weigh in on this particular discussion? Well, only if your answer is stars, <laughs> then you can contact us. We don't want to hear from you, or if we do, then we'll just ignore it if it's anything else. But if you want to agree with Emily... Yep, I would say first place to go is our website. It is so fab. Uh, we've got a lovely little contact form there, which flies into an inbox that Chris looks at. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yes. um, yeah, so go to scissorg.fm, S-Y-Z-Y-G-Y.fm. Him. Yes, indeed. And not only the contact form, but all of our past episodes going back 100 plus, way back to the very beginnings. All of the episodes, all of the fabulous images and links and all of that stuff is on there. Do you know what else is on there is uh, links to our social media, which, mm. you know, we've, we've reduced the amount of social media oh, by, isn't it by nice? one. Yeah. And taken, I mean, look, if Elon wants to go and blow up rockets, that's his thing. But blowing up Twitter, I think, is is not forgivable. So we'll just but bow out of that, that one for a while. I think this is the modern thing, right? People are people are reducing their exposure to social media yes. in a general way because we've realised that actually trying to do seventeen million different things at once is a little bit overwhelming. I mean, what do we look like? Teenagers? We're not teenagers. We can't keep up. So we are on the Instas. Yeah, we are on Instagram. Just yep. Check us out at at Pod. and we are on Facebook. Yep. And Facebook doesn't do at things. You just Put into the search box and go, Syzygy, podcast, what? Then it'll send us, send you in our direction and you'll find us. We had a lovely message from one of our listeners we this week we uh, on the, from Facebook. And uh, it was some pictures of that from their travels uh, in Taiwan, I think it mm-hmm. was. And uh, there's the Syzygy Cafe. Yeah, which I think, I like, how amazing is that that someone's named their cafe after us? I know. I mean, that's awesome. It's, it's a big ego boost, isn't it? Do you reckon we could get funding to go and visit? I think we should. Oh, absolutely. We should put in for a grant. Yeah. Look, if anyone's listening that, that thinks that's a good idea and you've got some spare cash to send us over to the Syzygy Cafe, get in touch. We'll do sure. it on our world trip with the solar yeah. eclipse thing as well. Like, you could yeah. come. That'd be yeah. awesome. Anyway. Listen, if you wanted to help in other ways, not necessarily by sending us to to uh, Syzygy-themed cafes on the other side of the world, there are a bunch of different ways that you could do that. You could simply tell everyone that you know that there's this podcast full of awesome space and astronomy and astrophysics and cosmology stuff, and they should go and have a listen and point them in our direction. The other thing you can do is give us a review. Give us some stars on your podcast player or, or directory of choice because that helps us to rise up through the noise and find helps other people find us. And lastly, if you did want to throw a bit of cash our way to help us keep that fabulous webpage going and to help us do the things we do here on Syzygy, then you can go to patreon.com slash syzygypod. And for the cost of what's the going rate that they tend to throw out on these things, a coffee. A coffee a week or a coffee a month. You can help us to keep the electrons flowing. And that would be fabulous. And you would have your name added to the great wall of thanks on our website, along with all of our other patrons. But otherwise, just keep listening. And we will be back again in, look, a number of days slash weeks. I think the the experience of the last couple of weeks shows anything can happen. And we are ready and prepared for anything. But Emily, let's say... In a week ish. Yes, we'll go yeah. with that. Sounds good. We'll be back for another episode well, of the Plus or minus 100%, right? That's, yeah, a, that's, that's a typical error in astrophysics. That's right. We're, we're going astronomical error bars here. So, to within plus or minus a week, we'll see you in a week. See Catch you up later. with you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.